Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Poultry Science Association's winter webinar. Uh, thank you all for joining us as PSA continues to help promote information and research related to the poultry industry. My name is Tom Porter, and I'm the president of the Poultry Science Association. Before I introduce our speaker, let's go over a few help, uh, useful tips for using Zoom webinars. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on PSA's website within 24 hours of the conclusion of this webinar. If you have a question, please type the question in the Q&A tab by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Do not use the raise hand icon. Attendees cannot be permitted to speak in order to ask questions. When you ask a question in the Q&A tab, someone will answer your question or you will be alerted that the question is going to be answered live by our presenter. There will be time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. All attendees will be able to like or comment on other attendees' questions. The more likes that a question has, the higher priority it will be given. Please like a question if you have the same question or would also like to have the question answered during Q&A. If we run out of time to answer all the questions at the end of the webinar, we will go in order of the priority each question has been assigned. The chat option has been dis uh, disabled for this webinar, but please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A tab. The subtitles are enabled for this webinar, but you can turn them off by clicking on the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen and selecting hide subtitles. So now uh, let's move on to the introduction of our speaker. We are joined here today by Dr. Mike Kogut. Dr. Kogut is a research microbiologist and lead scientist at the Southern Plains Agricultural Research Center in College Station, Texas. He has published over 220 peer-reviewed scientific papers, 19 book chapters, and has received five patents. Dr. Kogut's research has concentrated on the development of cost-effective immunological interventions to improve gut health by studying the role of the microbiota in immunity to infection, the role of dietary metabolites in promoting immune regulation and immune responses to pathogens, characterizing novel molecular targets that mediate the actions of dietary compounds in inflammation and immunity, and understanding the integration of central metabolic pathways in nutrient sensing with antimicrobial immunity. If he wasn't busy enough, Dr. Kogut is also the editor-in-chief of PSA's journal, Poultry Science. His dedication and work on behalf of the Poultry Science Association is appreciated greatly. We are excited to have Dr. Michael Kogut as our guest speaker today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kogan. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the introduction and it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. If I can figure out how to get these slides to move. All right. There we go. Okay, um, as the title is suggesting, I'm going to give a broad overview of the role of the gut during health and disease. Um, as I said, it's gonna be a broad overview. Instead of trying to concentrate on any one specific disease state, I'm gonna keep it broad strokes so that uh, knowing that the audience is, is, is part of the Poultry Science Association and try to uh, demonstrate where the gut is playing a role in other physiological systems uh, within the, the, the bird's uh, body. What I thought I'd do before I get into the talk is provide the audience with 
some take home messages ahead of time instead of waiting to the end so that you, you are cued in to where I'm going. Uh, first of all, I'm going to use this phrase diet, microbiota, immunometabolism access regularly here. Um, and, and, and obviously, each component is going to be discussed in its own right. Um, but it, it, is, it is important to understand that it's not just one component within the gut, but that it is a, a different a bunch of different systems that work and regulate not only at the intestinal level, uh, but also uh, uh, systemically. Uh, obviously, the, the, the diet is a big component of what makes the gut work, and we're going to talk about the diet quite a bit, um, and it's going to be the one common thread throughout the talk. The other thing that is probably a little bit hidden within the talk itself is this idea that the microbiota is acting as a, a similar to an endocrine organ because it produces metabolites. Um, which has not only effect locally, but systemically. And that, that, that will come out during the course of the talk. Towards the end, I'm going to talk about inflammation. And I think this is important take home in that inflammation um, seems to be a four-letter word uh, to the animal production people. Inflammation is a normal physiological function whose sole function is to repair. What, when it becomes a problem, is when the trigger is not removed and it's there. And we'll talk more about this later. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about way at the end, but I think it, it, it's related, uh, I, I refer to it a couple of times during the talk, is the idea of causation versus correlation. As we study the gut, most of the uh, research over the last 10, 15 years have been more correlative and we need to move and are moving more to causative and cause and effect type of, of relationships. So how am I gonna do this? I'm gonna follow this general outline. I'm gonna break the talk down into three sections. The first is an introductory. I'm gonna point out gut health and why gut health should be looked at from a different perspective when we're talking about poultry or animal production versus human medicine. There's a, it, it's, it's similar, but different because of the way the, the human animal and the, and the production animals uh, are, are grown. And then I'll give this general overview about what makes up a healthy uh, intestine and the ecosystem involved, how does it function? And then turn that around and say, okay, what happens if there's a disruption? And as I mentioned earlier, I'm not gonna talk about any specific disease. I'm gonna give a broad stroke and I'm gonna talk about the two processes that are involved when it, the system is disrupted, that being dysbiosis, the change in the composition of the microbiota, and inflammation. And specifically, and when I get there, I'll, I'll point out why chronic inflammation, low-grade chronic inflammation, as a, an issue that is probably understudied in poultry, um, but as is, is, is we move forward, I think is going to be even more important before finishing up with some challenges and, and, and opportunities as we do move forward. <laughs> So let's begin. Now we're all, since this is a poultry science uh, webinar, we're all aware of the different parts of, poultry, of, the, of growing a chicken and how they interact with each other. When it comes down to discussing the gut and the costs involved with, with growing an animal, we really concentrate on, on two areas, that being the nutrition of the diet of the animal and the health of the animal. And this parlays out itself into some basic uh, concepts. First of all, nutrition is the main production cost. Finding dietary components, buying them, and getting them into the uh, into the uh, barn is a obviously a quite a costly operation. And then the health of the animal, and and uh, obviously whether it be treatment or nutrition, birds uh, having to be removed or die. Uh, certainly, I think everyone that has ever listened to a talk on on the gut and gut health uh, has heard the quote of Hippocrates that all disease begins in the gut. Uh, if, it, if the disease didn't start in the gut, it certainly works its way through the gut uh, in manipulating the physiology of the animal. And so both of these components are really very much involved in what we describe as gut health. When I discuss gut health, I really like to, to break it down into the two components. And this is where it becomes important to understand production animals, poultry, pigs, and swine versus human 
uh, health and where the gut health uh, definition changes. I break it down into the two components, the gut and health. Now the gut, as we're all aware, is this hollow tube uh, that extends throughout the body. But keep in mind the literature and what I'm gonna talk about today, we're talking about the intestine, but the gut itself starts in the back of the oral cavity and works this all the way down through the vents uh, in the bird. So we're, we're talking about this giant tube, but I will concentrate on the intestine as does most of the literature. So you have this tube that is literally separating the external environment from the internal environment of the animal, okay? So this huge interface, the, yes, the tube is inside the animal, but the environment is there within the lumen. And so this, uh, the, the, the ex uh, external environment is separated from the internal uh, uh, part of the animal by a multiple barrier system. We always just think of the epithelial cell layer, but there are really four or five different layers, a chemical layer. The microbiota themselves um, are a layer of protection, um, a barrier, a, a part of, of the, uh, uh, the overall barrier. There's a chemical barrier with the, with the mucus, there's antimicrobial peptides, the physical barrier. And then of course the immune system, which lies in the lamina propria. And since we are talking about an external environment in contact with, uh, with the internal environment, there, the number of immune cells within the gut is the most prevalent there because of the potential exposure to toxins and pathogens and everything else. Now, health-wise, this is where it gets interesting and where the separation occurs. By definition, health is the absence or prevention of disease. But when we're talking about chicken, we're talking about uh, production animals, we are really talking about what does it take to reach as close to 100% of their genetic potential as possible. We're taking a broiler chick at hatch and putting it on a floor that has, um, in most cases, used litter, or an environment that is absolutely not sterile. It's certainly not a maternity ward as a human ch a child would be in. So we're, we're already putting the uh, the animal, the chicken in an environment uh, that is not necessarily absence of disease, disease causing um, uh, situations, but the idea is to reach its genetic potential. So if we put these two, two uh, terms together, what we're talking about is the ability of this hollow tube and the barrier function um, and the other components of the gut how can, they, how can they help the bird withstand the stressors of the environment, whether it be infectious or non-infectious, so that the animal can maintain homeostasis, which is a relative term depending on where the animal is. Obvious homeostasis in Texas in the summer is not the same as Canada in the winter. Homeostasis is relative to the environment that's in. But the key is, can the animal perform the physiological functions that it's genetically programmed for? And that is how close can we get to 100% of its genetic potential? I think it's generally understood that a broiler uh, in, in the world nowadays reaches 95 to 97% or so, give or take, uh, of its genetic potential. So the idea is if we can improve that health, the gut health of that animal by a single percent, bring it up to 96, 98, 99% of its potential, that's billions of dollars profit to the farmer and to the industry. So this is what I see why gut health in animals is different from, from humans. Now, when we're talking about gut health and homeostasis, we're talking about a house of cards that involves the macro environment as well as internal uh, influencers like the feed, et cetera, et cetera. I'll talk more about these as we go along and other factors within the animal, the animal uh, itself in terms of its physiology. And so this process is built upon this house of cards that is very delicate, but at the same time dependent upon each other. And it's <clears throat> very influential. But let's take it even a step further and look more at it. And what I describe as the diet microbiota, immunometabolic axis. And I, I specifically use the word immunometabolism because you cannot generate an immune response, you cannot stimulate an immune cell without changing the metabolism. So I, I like to incorporate an immunometabolic phrase and not just immunity. And this is, this is the ecosystem within the gut uh, uh, of an animal. And you can see that it includes the extrinsic and intrinsic as well as the microbiota and the interactions there. 
we see the diet and the environmental stresses have an effect not only on the microbiota and not only on the host, but they interact with both. And yet there's interchange between uh, uh, both the host immune system and the microbiota. So the immune system is regulating control of the uh, composition of the, of the bugs and the microbiota through its metabolites and uh, utilization of diet is also affecting the immune system. And I'll talk more about this uh, as, as we go along. So this axis, this diet, microbiota, immunometabolic axis, it's obviously a complex series of systems that are made up of chemical, biochemical, and biological uh, components. They function separately, but they function together and influence each other. So an effect on one will affect the other. We'll talk about this in, in the next slide. And what goes on at the gut is that the production of metabolites and hormones and neurotransmitters all interact and let the gut regulate local and systemic physiology. And what I just have here is just some of a couple of the, of the interactions that are going on, whereas you know, the diet can regulate composition diversity of the bugs based on what you're feeding the animal, the microbes will change according to what's there. They then can transduce those signals uh, that, that uh, will respond to the host and the host then can recognize various uh, components of the diet, as well as the metabolites to uh, control uh, the microbiome. However, it's important to understand that this axis is not linear. It's not straightforward. That there, the, As I mentioned in the previous slide, these interactions are, are multiple. And I think this slide sort of gives you a visual of, of what I'm talking about. For example, if we talk about the immune system, as I mentioned a couple of times, it shapes the microbiome. By shaping the microbiota, you are also shaping the metabolites that the microbiota produce, which then would have an effect on the immune response. So we have this kind of pathway. Well, the microbiota also are involved. They can take dietary components, metabolize them, produce other uh, type of metabolites that would also potentially have immunomodulatory effects. The diet itself, obviously, can uh, have an effect on the microbiota, which would then have a direct effect on the immune system. And lastly, the diet also can be uh, worked through the gut or through the host, which then have an effect on the microbiota, which can then change the immune system. So we have this type of situation as well. So it's not a linear, it's interactive and it's constant. So it, it keep in mind when we, you know, when we read the, when you read the literature, we talk about feed additives. We talk about all these alternatives to antibiotics, the biotics, immune modulators. When you give one and assume that, well, we'll give a diet and it's changing the microbiota, we forget about the immune system and vice versa. They are all interactive. You provide something to the host, it's going to change all. And I think that these interactions are important to understand. This is the causation that I referred to in the first slide. It's we're constantly just saying, well, we give this and the animal grows, which ultimately is what we want, but what is truly going on and are we truly uh, having a causal or a correlative type of effect? Now, this slide is, is the first of two, and I'll show later on when I'm talking about disease, in terms of talking about the diet and the diet's effect and, and the constituents of a diet on the positive nature. We, we know about fiber, uh, the importance of fiber. There's also various components of the diet that are very positive and beneficial to maintaining that barrier system um, and, and keeping the, 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 the health of the gut going. The other component that we need to keep in mind is that the immune system is there controlling that microbiota so there's no overgrowth. So there's a balance, there's a tolerance. The immune system is allowing those bugs to stay there, the microbiota, so that uh, they know they benefit the host. So this is the beneficial side of that coin that <clears throat> how diet is involved in not only health, but also disease. And we'll talk about the other side of this coin in a, in a few slides. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times metabolites, and it's important to understand that the microbes of the microbiota produce um, a, a multitude of, uh, of metabolites that we don't even know the majority of the time. 
but I'm going to show in the next few slides are, are some examples of how the microbiota can take what's given in the diet and manipulate uh, the dietary components into benefits for not only themselves, but also for, for the host. And in this case, um, the, the we're, I'm sure everyone is familiar with taking uh, polysaccharides and producing small chain fatty acids. And the end result is a series of physiological changes. Most people understand that, for example, butyrate is an energy component for the epithelial cell. We also recognize, most people recognize that the butyrate has um, anti-inflammatory effects. But depending on the true nature of what's needed at the gut level, these small chain fatty acids, including butyrate, can be pro-inflammatory. Again, that's decided at the gut level by the host and the interaction with the microbiota. Um, <clears throat> dietary amino acids can also be broken down into components that are also immunomodulatory. <clears throat> now, one of the more interesting uh, uh, metabolites, a series of metabolites, are when microbiota can take something that the host has actually changed. So the, uh, the, the development and production of bile acids by the liver can then be broken down and manipulated by the microbiota into secondary bile acids. And their effect on immunity is also well known. What's becoming more and more interesting in the literature in the last year or so is that these bile acids are not only playing a role in immunity and physiology at the liver, the gut liver uh, axis, but they're also playing a dramatic role systemically at on or, other organ systems and are actually regulating inflammation beyond the gut and regulating immune system beyond the gut. And this is something that has, was, has not been looked at uh, previously. Everything thought was uh, maintained at the gut level, and that's just not the case. And the third type of, of a metabolites is where the, 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 the microbiota synthesize metabolites on their own. Uh, I think everyone's aware that the, the microbiota, our biochemical uh, powerhouse, they produce loads of ATP that cannot possibly be used by the microbiota themselves. Well, if you are generating immune cells, and especially if they go into an activated state, they require ATP. And so they can utilize the ATP produced by the microbiota in terms of activation, deactivation of the immune response. And then there are waste products that the microbiota, for this, this example is Bacteroides fragilis, produces a, a waste product, the polysaccharide A, that also has immunomodulatory activity. And so there's loads of these type of metabolites that we don't even know about that can play a very, very, very important role in regulation, not only the gut, but overall uh, physiology of the animal. So this cartoon basically is, is, is showing what I've talked about the previous slide. So here's the axis where the, uh, the diet as an environmental uh, a signal, the metabolites that are derived by both the immune system, by the host and the microbiota are then translated into uh, 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 signaling uh, peptides, which then talk to each other and can regulate what's going on at the gut level but it doesn't stop there. What is produced by the immune system, by the microbiota, for example, as I mentioned, the metabolites, but also hormones and trend, a neurotransmitter by the host can also affect the animal systemically, can regulate systemic physiological functions, which I think is something that is very, very important for those of us in poultry work, is that we can manipulate the bird beyond the gut. And uh, this slide, which is dealt with humans and mice, gives you an indication uh, of a few years ago of what I'm talking about. The, the actual function of the immune system from the gut can, reg can regulate other physiological systems. And this is probably best described here where the gut brain axis, gut lung, gut liver axis is becoming more and more identified and that not only can you manipulate these organ systems, the immune system through the gut, where you can actually induce a protection against respiratory bugs or against liver type infection, but you can also manipulate behavior. And I've been predicting for the last couple of years that we have the ability in poultry to, by manipulating the gut, to change the behavior of the animal. For example, 
fee conversion. Can we make the animal believe that it's full so that it's not eating as much to generate the growth and production that we're saying for a broiler to gain the weight so that we can reduce these costs of feed simply by changing what's going on at the gut level. I think it's feasible. I think it just needs to be manipulated a little bit more and looked at more, um, but it's, it's important. What I don't have on here and another area that is becoming more and more interesting, certainly through human medicine, but I believe it's important in, in bird work is the gut muscle, skeletal muscle axis. <clears throat> we have generated data where it looks like what's, if you induce an inflammatory response at the gut level, it also may be playing a role in the myopathies, the muscle myopathy, uh, myopathies that we, we're seeing in the animal. And I think this is another interesting area that if we can reduce uh, wooden breast uh, uh, through the gut, maybe an interesting means of, of looking at, at other research opportunities. Uh, just a couple of slides to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. How do these, uh, 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 how do the microbiota affect systemically? Well, obviously, metabolites, as well as, and I can't, we can't forget that components of the bacteria, the LPS, the peptidoglycan, the um, uh, and various other components, these bugs are constantly dying and they can manipulate the system. So they get into the circulatory system and make their way uh, through the circulatory system to other organs of the body. And thus we have these multiple uh, um, axes with the gut. Alternatively, indirectly, the uh, epithelial cells that are lining uh, the gut, as well as the sub, uh, underlying immune, system, immune cells, can translate these messages to immune systems and move through the circulation to other parts of the gut and can manipulate um, uh, what's going on as well. One thing I want to point out here is that we're talking about the mucosal immune system at the gut. We know about the mucosal immune system in the reproductive organs and in the lung. We are not talking about different um, systems within each organ. These are interconnected. This mu the, the mucosal immunity of the different organs are interconnected. So if you can manipulate one, say at the gut level, you should be able to manipulate what's going on mucosally in these other organ systems that have the mucosal immune uh, system available. And lastly, as I, as I mentioned, <clears throat> within the gut, there are specialized cells uh, endocrine cells that will produce hormones that can reach the brain, but also reach other organs. Also, uh, the gut microbiota can manipulate, uh, um, and produce metabolites that have direct effect on the uh, nervous system, which can manipulate the brain. And so we can, again, manipulate these systems through what's going on at the gut by uh, feed and by manipulating the microbiome. So this is a general broad overview of the gut uh, during a healthy situation. Well, let's move into well, what happens if, if it's disrupted. What, what changes occur? I mentioned earlier the idea that this house of cards that produces homeostasis, if one card is disrupted, then the whole system can become disrupted, all right? And we, we recognize this as environmental stresses, whether it be infection or non-infection, and that these leads to microbial imbalances um, uh, and, and inflammation. Now, there is controversy, which comes first, no pun intended, chicken and the egg. Is it dysbiosis causes inflammation or vice versa? Um, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, certainly, inflammation is a normal part of the, uh, uh, the, the immune system at the gut level. Uh, physiological information is constantly working and we don't have a dysbiosis. It's when we just change the inflammatory, the basic system, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides, that would induce a dysbiosis. On the other side of the coin, we know, for example, when we do the feed changeover from a starter to grower, that we can disrupt the composition of, of the microbiota for that period of time, for a day or two before it tries to return and it never does return to normal, but we don't induce a, a necessarily an inflammatory response there. So it, it, it's, it's controversial, but interesting and something to look at as we move forward. Obviously, when we're talking about environmental stresses that would have an effect, a negative effect that would disrupt the, the uh, 
the gut health, we're talking about a series of, of, of infectious and non-infectious pathogens, obviously, coccidia, salmonella, campylobacter, et cetera, so, as well as viruses that are that can have negative effect on the immune system itself. Husbandry, obviously, there, there was a lot of controversy over the years about density, which is uh, obviously changed, reused litter, exposing the animals to potential pathogens. Certainly after the summer we had here in the United States, as well as worldwide, weather is obviously the climate change, the heat, uh, in the summer cold, mycotoxins that seem to be. But the one common denominator, the one thing we can't get away from, the one thing that's not seasonal is feeding these animals. They have to be fed. And obviously there's been a, a, a number of articles in the literature that about the various components and textures, et cetera, et cetera, about diet. And I'm gonna concentrate on the dietary aspect in terms of dysbiosis and inflammation um, for the rest of the talk. Now, to separate them out and just define what they are and how they work, and I think it's important, I'll start with dysbiosis. Regardless of the cause, what we see is a change in the composition of the microbiome, a change in the diversity, okay? which usually leads to the ability of potential pathogens, the salmonella, especially in clostridium, to propagate. But what is going on is that balance, that uh, the tolerance that is normally there that I talked about and showed with the one slide where the um, Tregs are managing the T helper 1s, T helper 17. This balance is disrupted. Okay, whether it be a repression of the regulatory issue or in stimulation of the TH1 or 17, what ultimately occurs is that the immune system is no longer being tolerant. It is actually reacting against the commensal bugs. So you're changing the diversity by reducing the number of bugs that are there. Uh, there is no specific response that we are aware of in terms of what it's directed against, it is just a general, all of a sudden these bugs are now considered foreign instead of tolerating. So when you disrupt the, the bugs that are there, you are obviously gonna disrupt function. So the metabolites that we talked about previously during a healthy situation are gonna change dramatically as well because you are disrupting the bugs that are there. So there is gonna be a change in the metabolites because of the change in the uh, composition of what's there and you're gonna change the metabolic activity. And so not only locally, but systemically, you can have negative effects. And this is the other side of the coin that I mentioned before, is that depending upon, and again, using feed as, as the main cause, poor quality, high energy, different types of grains, et cetera, et cetera, instead of promoting that barrier system, it's actually eroding the barrier system, that the metabolites that are being produced are not as uh, in, uh, not regulating the composition, they're not ready to regulating the immune response, the barrier system is breaking down, and we have this changeover in immune cells that are there, and leading to an inflammatory response, that as long as that trigger, that feed is there, it's going to be maintained, and I'll talk about that in a slide or two. So, these are the same paragraphs that I talked about before, but again, it's the other side of the coin where because of an, a, a negative effect, a negative component within the feed, you can then alter what's going on at the gut level, at the microbiota, so that diet, microbiota, immunometabolic axis has been altered and the signaling components have changed. Now I put this slide together <coughs> just talk about broiler operation and, 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 and how feed and diet plays a, such a major role in, in each component, from the breeders to the broilers and environmental management. And you see um, the, the different parts of where the, of the, uh, the diet and the dietary components ha can have an effect. One thing I wanted to show here that is incredibly interesting is that right here under management, under broilers, that every one of these five or six uh, components are identical to what we recognize in human medicine in terms of metabolic disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes. These are the same characteristics, notice, that we see 
in humans. Now, obviously, in a broiler, we're talking about a bird that's going to market in five weeks. It may be too soon to see a dramatic effect of these type of things. But I think we're all aware that if we're raising a broiler to eight weeks for a, a breast meat yield. We see a lot of these type of metabolic issues in that last two or three weeks of those birds uh, get before they go to market. So this is this is an interesting uh, avenue to look at in terms of feed and induction of uh, inflammation. So just a step back, and for me to talk about inflammation, as I mentioned earlier, inflammation is a normal physiological response. It's highly coordinated. Okay. Yes, it does involve energy, and it does and involve some damage, maybe some tissue destruction. The whole function is to, re to repair and return to homeostasis. The length of an inflammatory response is 100% dependent upon a trigger. We recognize an acute response where an infection or a minor injury, the, the trigger is recognized, removed. So yes, it does involve some energy. Yes, it involves some destruction, but the repair process starts rapidly and it doesn't take energy away from the animal itself. It's very rapid. Within a day or two, it's taken care of. However, then a chronic response, the trigger is there. So we, we think of the diet. What component or components within a diet would be inflammatory? And you're feeding this animal 24 seven, these components, that trigger is not removed. That trigger is still there. So you're not repairing, you have unresolved damage and some loss of function at that organ level, at that intestinal level. It may not be grossly, and we have studies showing that there's no visual gross pathology in the gut, but overall when the, the growth of the animal is reduced. And this slide just short, shows what I'm talking about under homeostatic conditions, that inflammation, that physiological inflammation. So we have an acute response goes back and it's been controlled. That balance between tolerance and immune response is there. But under chronic conditions, it's maintained. It's very unstable. I think this is important because of the potential of diet causing some serious problems. When we think about the kind of low grade, non pathogen, well, not no gross lesion, uh, chronic inflammation that's based on diet. There's two types, feed induced, um, where the uh, components of the feed, such as beta galactins, uh, galactomannins, but also metabolic inflammation due to nutrient excess. And I'll talk about each of these in the next couple of slides. I think all of us are aware the beta mannins that are in soybean meal, meal, uh, meal as well as other legumes. The mannose receptor of the innate immune response recognizes these beta mannins and stimulate a response. Of course, we and others have shown that beta mannanases, enzymes can break these down that will totally eliminate the ability to induce inflammatory response as well as provide more nutritive components. And I think this is what we, uh, one area of, of enzyme, exogenous enzymes that are provided to a diet of the chicken is, is, is ignored is that yes, we are breaking down these large components that the bird can't uh, uh, digest to smaller components that are, can be used as nutrients, but I think they're also involved in breaking down what would be inflammatory components um, uh, the, of these large molecules and reducing uh, the, the inflammatory response. The bigger issue is if you are feeding something to excess, obviously we're feeding these birds 24 seven, they are programmed to eat and eat and eat. And once you get to a point where it's excess, that they're no longer necessarily utilizing everything that's there, these excess nutrients and components are recognized by the innate immune system. The other side of the coin is that if, you are, if they are being metabolized, you are producing an excess of inflammatory signaling molecules. For example, citrate and succinate from the TCA cycle. So this has, again, a negative effect on that homeostasis balance between the Treg and the TH17. And I think this picture from a, 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 a 12, 13-year-old uh, talk uh, paper gives a pretty good idea. Under normal conditions, you have metabolic pathways, you have your innate pathways, and you have your acquired pathways. 
if you are eating or the animal is eating to excess, that the, the system, the, the metabolic pathways can no longer handle it. You have excess nutrients in the environment. The innate system will recognize and stimulate response. So you're stimulating, again, the trigger of an, of an inflammatory response. And if it gets to too prolonged, you can actually kick in uh, the acquired, the T-cell response. And we have generated a new paper that, that shows that we can always talk about it some more time. So if, what does this mean um, in terms of low-grade chronic inflammation? The available energy does not meet what the bird needs to grow. So you have decreased cellular energy. The animal's not reaching uh, the growth weight that it needs to. What happens is that you're going from an energy-efficient oxfos uh, meta metabolism to one that is uh, aerobic glycolysis, which is less energy efficient, far fewer amount of ATP. We recognize the oxidative stress that, that has been very big in the literature, decreased feed efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. So chronic low-grade inflammation has a negative effect on growth of the animal. And we have this cycle then. Again, we recognize that and I have here is dysbiosis, we recognize the stimulating immune response, we recognize the production of uh, oxygen radicals and nitric uh, oxide radicals, which have an effect on prolonging inflammation that keeps there as long as that trigger is there, which ultimately is going to lead to depressed growth of the animal. And this slide just sort of sums that up, that if you have a prolonged trigger, you are going to stimulate the inflammatory response, which increases oxidative stress, which has a negative effect on profits, which increases the uh, uh, ability of, of pathogens to colonize, colonize and, and grow in the animal, which ultimately leads to an, an economic loss. So to finalize, to finish the talk, some challenges, hopes, opportunities, uh, which I've seen over the last 10 years. Um, I talked multiple times about um, causality we need, and we are moving away. The, the literature is becoming increasing where people are stopping, stop, stopping experiments where we're just feeding way in and saying, oh, look what's happening. We're actually establishing what is causing the effect. We do need to have more studies where we're looking at this diet, microbiota, immunometabolic access, and providing evidence of causality. The other side of the coin is we need to understand more about the ecology and functional groups. We have spent years and a lot of money identifying individual genus, genera of bugs that have changed when there are trillions of bugs for every gram of tissue in the gut. One Changing one or two or three bugs does not change everything. It's how they function. I think that's what's important. We need to have a better idea of what are we doing when we change the diet or if we give a probiotic, what is it doing functionally to the animal? And I'll show that in the next slide uh, more visually. The other side of the coin, which I think is very interesting is that 90%, if not more, of the studies that have been out in the literature talk about the Sika. And that's obvious because there's more bugs there, so it's easier to recognize changes. And that's where most of the pathogens grow. But where functionally is it important part of the gut, in the foregut, in the duodenum. Where is nutrient digestion absorption taking place? In the upper part of the gut. Far fewer microbiota, but at the same time, we haven't spent anywhere near amount of time understanding what the role of the microbiota is in the foregut and what is going on in this diet axis up there. And obviously, um, the, the pressures of the modern poultry industry to produce chickens at a rapid rate is obviously an issue. I, I, I throw this slide in. I think most people that talk about the gut try to throw it in. This is a, a, a talk or a, a, a paper in 2012 dealing with humans or mice, but we saw some uh, data similar to this in, at the World Poultry this summer, where you're looking at five or six different mucosal systems and look at across the top of the bugs that change over time, but the metabolic pathways do not change. So the idea that we identify changes in a few bugs here, we're not changing here. What we need to correlate and, and show causation is if we change here, what is the functional activity here that leads to this? And what happens if we change it enough that this is the, we need to have a better idea of metabolic 
of functional functionality. And I leave you with this last slide, a repeat of what I showed the first slide. Hopefully the take home messages have been uh, brought forward. And with that, I'll end uh, the presentation and be glad to take um, any questions. Thank you. Mike, uh, we have one question in here um, from uh, Cristiano uh, Bortoluzzi. Yep. Um, the question is, Mike, do you have any comments on the inflammation caused by peptidoglycans in the gut? Well, obviously, peptidoglycans are a big component of gram-positive bugs, which are a big part of, of the, the microbiota. So yes, the, the peptidoglycans are um, inflammatory. Uh, they they do cause cause issues. I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind, especially with poultry, is this reverse peristalsis. So not only are we getting components and metabolites at the gut level and being leached out, but because of reverse peristalsis, these same materials that are inflammatory are working their way back up the gut during reverse peristalsis. So we're doubling the inflammatory ability of these materials and. Such, since such a huge population of the microbiota are gram-positive, peptidoglycans are going to be very detrimental and very much involved in the stimulation of inflammatory response um, at the gut level. Um, another question from uh, Greg Enkelke. Mike, since there are so many separate multi-factored systems that are interacting with other system based on specific microbial or pathway chemical components, mm -hmm. once again, with specific roles. Therefore, the ability to within an animal trial series, it is impossible to truly measure and determine specific modes of actions for the multiple moving parts. Can we use sequential modeling and artificial intelligence to truly measure and, de and determine the greatest specific areas of action and specific components um, or factors, uh, other factors can we, or should we change? Great question. And the simple answer is absolutely. Um, I like to think that if we can use artificial intelligence as a means of identifying highly important pathways, starting at the gut, then we can always develop experiments to prove or disprove it, okay? So I think that, that AI is a major player in where we're going with this, because I don't, I agree that we can't break these components down in any one system. As, and that's sort of, I sort of alluded to that at the beginning there, we give something as a feed additive, as a biotic, and without looking at the, all the components together, we're making conclusions. And I think AI will allow us to identify some really specific pathways. However, do we have enough information to provide the computer at this point in time to make those decisions? In human medicine, I think they do. I don't think we have it yet in poultry work. I think there is still some pathway and signaling components that need to be worked out that we can feed into a computer that allow us to allow it to make decisions for us. Another question, Mike, any idea how the microbiota of a, of a pullet going through a feed control program compares to that of a broiler? Great question and one that we're attempting to answer and get into. The idea that obviously a broiler, you're feeding for it to grow. A pullet, you're trying to keep it from growing. And so you're talking about the opposite type of effect, yet at the same time, it is my belief that you are inducing an inflammatory response from a different perspective. You're not necessarily giving this excess material. You are literally removing material from these animals so they don't grow 
and that's going to have a negative effect. It's an interesting dichotomy because it's inflammation, but it's not necessarily caused by too much. It's caused by too little. And so, yes, definitely there's a difference between the two, dramatic difference. In regards to probiotics, what are expected changes that can be seen in the foregut and hindgut versus in the cecum? Well, I mean, as I said, functionally, we're talking about the hindgut, we're talking about nutrient absorption, digestion. Okay, so we have an endpoint to measure there. Um, whereas the cecum, we just seem to be measuring pathogen. Okay, the, the, and the cecum provides us with a lot more bugs. So it makes it that much more complex. Whereas in the, up in the duodenum, for example, there are less than a third. You know, 99% of what of the microbiota in, in the duodenum are like the bacillus. That other 1% is probably the most important because they are regulating what's going on. But that the idea that there are that many fewer bugs I'm not saying it should be easier, but it's certainly we have an endpoint to measure that is nutrient absorption. And what, what, let's, let's stick with the 1%. What are those 1% doing? Can we knock them out with antibiotic or some other form? And what effect do they have on that nutrient absorption? So, yes, there's a huge spatial interaction that I think is important that we've ignored for too long. And that by manipulating it, can we increase absorption? Again, Go back to the idea, even behavior-wise, can we increase absorption? The birds are going to feel full. They're not going to eat as much because they're, they're, they're happier. <laughs> can you talk about amino acid supplementation in poultry and their potential association with pathogen prevalence, as well as effects on my screen just jumped? Sorry. Uh, where did it go? as well as effects on immune system? Well, I'm going to plead somewhat ignorance. I'm not a nutritionist, so I don't have specific answers for you. Obviously, amino acids are quite involved in development and function of the immune system, all right? So I, 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 that much I do know. But in terms of uh, discussing and having an intelligent discussion, I would have to defer to other people that that have much more, you know, Cristiano certainly did it with his PhD. He would be much more apt to answer that kind of question. But I could then throw in the immune response type of work that I do know, but I don't have an answer to that question. It's a good one, but I don't have a really. Well, then I'll ask you another nutrition question. All right. Any, any insight uh, into low or a low energy diet versus standard diet effects on homeostasis? Yeah, that that's a really, really good question. I think, um, <sighs> The issue to me is that if you go to low energy diet, the concept is interesting. You're slowing down growth, but what is that doing to the overall microbiota? And I don't think we have an answer to that. I think that the, the, I think the simple answer would be yes, that should have a major player and maybe play an interesting role in the issues. But biologically, that's telling me that's not the way to do it, that, that we're probably hurting the overall system by going that route. I think there's a compromise, and I don't know what that compromise is. I've been saying in webinars since, since uh, the COVID uh, 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 pandemic is that I think there needs to be a better understanding and more of a sit down between nutritionists, microbiologists, and immunologists, we need to work together instead of working in our own separate areas. I don't think we 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 communicate well enough. I mean, if if you think back to a couple of slides, I had on there uh, least cost formulation as being a negative effect, and I think one of the things that I took home from Paris this summer, when we talked about animal welfare and sustainability, does least cost formulation, and I'm not arguing against it. I understand why we have least cost, but are we providing what the animal needs on a welfare basis. To me, the genetics of the animal is protecting a nutritionist that's using a, a, a least cost formulation. Those birds, if you just give them enough, they're going to grow. 
if the genetics that wasn't there, would that least cost formulation get the birds that as close to that 100% as you would? And, and I think as an immunologist, I want to interact more with the nutritionist to, to convince me why we should go these different routes and what we need to do to manipulate. I'll get off my soapbox. Yeah. Um, what contribution do you think modulating the microbiome has in non-bacterial diseases like coccidiosis? Well, again, I think get away from the idea of changing the bugs that are there and changing the metabolites that are there, okay? You cannot change the metabolism. We have data that shows, for example, that Maxima changes dramatically at about 96 hours, changes the, the, the um, metabolism of the jejunum. Well, if that metabolism has changed, I guarantee you the microbiota have changed as well because you can't change host metabolism without changing the microbiota. So yes, if you can manipulate the microbiota during a non-bacterial or coccidial path uh, infection, then theoretically you are changing the, 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 the metabolites. And I think that is where we need to concentrate. Again, the metabolites, what's beneficial to the animal and detrimental to the bug? microbes are probably give us that answer. Could you comment on the interactions between, did I get this right, salmonella vaccines and chicken gut health? I'm not sure where the question is coming from. Um, certainly, the, the and, and, and I'm gonna answer from the perspective that for a vaccine to work, the microbiota has to be involved because of what I talked about, the, the microbiota immunometabolic act. So you, for a vaccine to be truly efficient, there's some involvement of the microbiota in the efficiency, especially at the gut level. Um, I'm not sure if that's what the question is about, but, but the idea that we can produce a vaccine and we're only going to sti stimulate a, an immune response without, like we've done for, 50 years without considering the microbiota, I think it's, it's naive. I think we have the ability and we should now be looking at what role, can we use the microbiota as an adjuvant with the vaccine? What does that do? And I don't think we have any data on that yet that would be beneficial to the industry. Um, do we have a good model to mimic low grade chronic inflammation in an experimental setting? Well, certainly we published a paper this year using diet as a, uh, we use a, a rice bran diet as a means of inducing a chronic three to five weeks. It took two weeks for the inflammation to show up, no gross lesions whatsoever, very little of negative effect on growth, but microscopically and uh, um, uh, immunologically dramatic change on what's going on. And what's interesting is that it's no longer mediated by the macrophage pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-1 and IL-6, mediated by IL-16 and IL-21. So it's a T-cell mediated immunity, this chronic inflammatory response. So we published that, uh, Gabby uh, Dupont, a uh, PhD student who just finished, published that in Frontiers this last, <clears throat> last year. Yeah. Um, this is one that comes up a lot when we talk about uh, microbiota studies. There's a lot of variation seen from bird to bird yep. when studying microbiota. Yep. Would you expect less variation when looking at a functional analysis uh, when looking at treatment effects? That's a really, really good question. Um, until we have a better handle on population, microbial population type of work, uh, if, if, if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, I'd say no. But I think we have to understand that changing, yes, the, 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 in terms of the question, we, we know that the microbiota, the variation is dramatic. We know within a population of a house, chances are it's not going to vary that much because the birds are relatively the same weight when they go to market. But what is that homeostasis in the barn next? What has changed? What is there? So I think, yes, the there is less variation 
um, in, within a house, but I think from house to house, the variation metabolically is going to be quite dramatic. It may not be the same functions, but I think that's something we just don't have enough information about. Um, what contribution do you think modulating the microbiome has in broiler bone health? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, certainly the literature says it's very important. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, there's there's enough in the literature. Dr. Whiteman of in Arkansas showed that for sure that uh, with his model of wire flooring, that manipulating the microbiota. Uh, has a dramatic effect on bone, bone formulation. So for sure, um, it, it, there's no doubt in my mind that the gut is involved in almost every organ system in the animal in one way or another, whether that is through straight uh, manipulation of the, of the uh, metabolites or components. Yes, it's, it's definitely involved. I'm gonna take the liberty of asking a question myself. I'm an endocrinologist and the gut is probably the largest endocrine organ that has been overlooked for, well, was overlooked for decades. Of all the hormones produced in the gut, mm -hmm. which ones do you think are affected most or primary targets for analysis? And I don't mean cytokines, I mean more classical about? hormones. You know, Tom, I, I'm I'm interested in the idea of, of growth hormone um, because one would assume that if you can manipulate the microbiota to regulate growth hormone, you're going to get to where you want to. And I'm suspicious that that's not the case, that there's not a one-to-one -one relationship. I think any hormone is still going to rely on other components or metabolites of the bug, of the bugs that they're producing. And so is it really a direct effect on growth hormone? Is it a direct effect on a different hormone or a neurotransmitter that is stimulating the production of that hormone? So I think you're right that it's in terms of an endocrine organ, but I also like the idea and this, this idea that the microbiota is also an endocrine organ. But how do they work together? You know, again, as a, as a biologist, you have to believe that they're just not thrown together willy-nilly, that they've evolved together, that they're that somehow they're interacting with each other and that it's not a straight linear relationship. I am not seeing any more uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, Dr. Kogut, thank you so much. Um, very interesting, very informative talk. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.